Hi, my name is Karthik Lal and I'm here to present my project that is image classification predicting dog breeds. This is part of the course uh, Introduction to Deep Learning. My motivation behind this project was twofold. The first was of course that I'll get to learn a lot. It, it's, it's a very complex image classification problem. I would get to enhance my skills in this particular domain. And the second reason is that even though I'm a very big dog person, my memory is very bad. So I thought, why not build a model in which I can just take a photo of a dog, upload it to my model, and my model tells me what breed that is. So let's get started. So the data, the Stanford's dog data sets consists of 20,580 images of various dog breeds, of 120 dog breeds to be precise. Uh, and the data also consists of annotations. Annotations, there are two types. There is the label of each image, and the second is uh, there is a precise bounding box of each dog, which essentially means that uh, where exactly is the dog in the image. That's what the second part tells us. Uh, each image has three colors, uh, but varying sizes. None of the images are grayscale, uh, but they have different sizes. So I did rescale the images. Thankfully, there were approximately equal number of images for various dog breeds. There was no severe class imbalance anywhere. As part of the pre-processing, the first thing I did was I uh, condensed the problem into a 11 class classification problem by choosing dog breeds at random. And this was essentially done uh, because uh, of the computing power at the moment that I have. I, I did my project mainly on Jupyter Notebook in my, uh, in my laptop and um, I also used Google Colab. I tried to run a model on 120 breeds. It was way too slow and uh, uh, I wasn't really getting any results from very, very few epochs that I could run the models for. So I decided that let me condense this down into a smaller classification problem and later on if I have higher compute power I can uh, extend this problem to 120 breeds. The second pre-processing step that I did was I cropped uh, each image using the bounding box provided in the annotations file. This was done essentially because in a lot of images there was uh, extra noise. For example, in these images there is a human being standing behind the dog uh, where only the dog is important. And if, if, if the model tries to learn the dog from here, it captures along with it a lot of bias uh, and noise. Same thing in this image, this dog is probably part of some dog's competition and uh, he's winning a medal, but there are also people around him. Just so that the model learns only information about this particular dog, we crop it out uh, into this form. Now what algorithms did I use? Uh, the most obvious choice for such a classification algorithm was the convolutional neural network. Uh, and why CNN is because it is very beautifully designed to sort of capture the spatial and temporal dependencies in an image. Uh, unlike a, a feed-forward neural network or a fully connected neural network where I would have passed a vector for every image. Uh, the problem there being that I would not be able to capture the uh, dependencies, the, the spatial dependencies, meaning I would not be able to capture uh, the dependencies between the nearby pixels to each other which in an image is very very important because a lot of them are very uh, much related temporally. A CNN as you may know involves at least one convolutional layer where the operation of convolution is performed on the data uh, and to add the element of non-linearity we have an activation function which in my case I've used ReLU. Uh, there is max pooling which reduces the dimension there are multiple convolutional layers and uh, layers and pooling layers involved back to back. And finally, we flatten the layers. We have a fully connected layer. And finally, we do a softmax if there are multiple categories to predict. Now, for this problem, I used three sorts of convolutional neural networks. The first one was which I trained myself. And I trained mainly three types of CNNs from scratch. Uh, one where there was no dropouts or batch normalization next to where batch normalization was there and the third where uh, dropouts I had added. The second type of neural net network that I created uh, was using the transfer learning phenomenon. I used the VGG16 
uh, to train my model for dog breeds classification and I also use Inception v3 which is basically Google Net the third, the third version. Now coming to the results from some of the CNNs. The first CNN where there was no batch normalization or dropouts. This neural network consisted of convolutional layers followed by max pooling uh, and these alternated one after the other and finally ending in a dense layer and then finally a soft max uh, dense layer after that. As you can see here is the plot of training accuracy, validation accuracy versus the number of epochs. Uh, it is very visible here that the model sort of overfits because after the 15th epoch the validation and training accuracy sort of diverge, they fork apart where the validation accuracy comes to a plateau but the training accuracy goes up. Uh, this is probably because there is no sort of regularization. That's why we uh, follow it up with the next CNN where we use batch normalization. Uh, now, batch normalization is used because as the signal propagates, the variance sort of increases. Uh, so we use batch normalization to essentially rescale the signal before it goes to the next layer. As you can see here, it does not overfit where both the training accuracy and the validation accuracy go hand in hand, they increase alongside with each other. Uh, it, had, it, had a, it had a slightly lesser accuracy than the previous case, although uh, as, as you can see it's 55 in the previous case and it is 49 here. But that's only because the, the lesser number of epochs that we train the data for. As you can see that the validation accuracy is still on the upward slope and had we trained it for many more epochs, say 50 to 100 epochs more, uh, it would have uh, gone even higher. The same was the case when we added the dropouts. As you can see, again, the validation and train accuracy increase hand in hand, and it has a validation accuracy of 51.04. Um, if we train it for more epochs, it will go up most, most likely. Next comes the VGG16. Now, VGG16 has uh, So the VGG16 contains 16 layers as the name suggests. The most unique thing about the VGG16 is that instead of having a large number of hyperparameters, they focused on having convolutional layers of 3x3 filters and stride 1 as you can see on the image here. Uh, and always sort of had the same padding and max pool layers of uh, 2x2 and stride uh, 2. And uh, in the end it has two fully connected layers as you can see here and followed by a soft max for the output. So this, so in, and in VGG16, we obtained a much better validation accuracy than the preceding models of around 69.95. And uh, as we can see here, it does not overfit, the model does not overfit uh, because the validation and training accuracy increase hand in hand. In fact, uh, the validation accuracy is slightly more than the training accuracy, which we'll discuss very soon. Even here, I believe um, if we had many more epochs, uh, the validation accuracy could have gone much higher. Uh, I, I limited the number of epochs here to about 20 because it was taking way too much time uh, on both Colab and on my Jupyter notebook. Now the Inception V3 is a convolutional neural network uh, which is 48 layers deep. So going, going back, just uh, talking about a little bit of history of the Inception networks. The Inception deep CNNs were introduced by the Google Net um, with the concept of inception net and then later on it was refined in many other ways by you know introducing batch normalization and then third uh, in which the factorization was also added to the features of inception and that's what inception v3 is all about it includes batch normalization uh, the concept of inception nets and also the factorization so the inception v3 performed the best out of all the algorithms uh, as you can see here the, uh, the validation accuracy goes up to around 75.68%, uh, which is higher than any of the other neural networks I trained. Now, very interestingly, the plot that you can see here shows that the validation accuracy is significantly better than the training accuracy. Now, a possible reason for that is that Inception V3, the network relies heavily on dropouts and other regularization techniques. Uh, as an example, for example, if I disable the neurons, I have a high dropout rate. Some of the information about each sample is lost. 
and the subsequent layers attempt to sort of construct the answers based on incomplete representations. The uh, training loss is higher because we have made it artificially harder for the network to give the right answers. However, during validation, all the neurons are available. So the network is running at its full computational power. It has all the parameters to predict, predict the data with. And thus, it might perform better, uh, you know, the validation might perform better than training. How to avoid this problem, perhaps, is we could have uh, uh, let the model train for a longer period of time for more epochs. That could have sort of converged the training and validation accuracy together. Now moving on to the confusion matrix of the Inception V3, uh, which is our champion model in this case. So as you see, most of the mass lies around the diagonal, which means that the images are getting predicted in the right way. There are some categories or some breeds per se, which uh, are misclassified more often than the others. For example, uh, the Chihuahua is classified often as a toy terrier. Um, the reason is because they look uh, somewhat similar in body structure and sometimes the Chihuahua uh, can also be black in color like a toy terrier. Um, unfortunately, in most of our training data, the Chihuahua was the standard color that is light brown, dark brown. That's why when uh, a black Chihuahua comes along in the validation set, it often sort of predicts it as a toy terrier, which is most often black. Now I thought, why not take random images of the internet and try my model, try to predict which breed that dog is. Uh, so first example is that of a Basset. Uh, the model correctly predicts that as a Basset, it has a 100% surety, that's pretty amazing. Uh, the next is a Toy Terrier, where the model predicts it correctly. The third example is where a Toy Terrier is predicted as a Papillon, which, is, uh, which, which looks similar in some cases. The next few examples are of a Japanese Spaniel, for instance, where the model did predict it correctly. Uh, then the next is a Basset, which again it did predict correctly. And the third example, I thought, why not play around with the model a little bit and uh, input a white cat to the model. Uh, now, of course, our training data did not have cats at all, and that's why it cannot predict it as a cat. Uh, and it'll try to predict the cat as a dog, which looks as similar to that cat as it can. Uh, and it turns out, yes, it does. The Maltese dog uh, is white in color, is that vibrant, shiny white in color. So essentially, the model was correct in whatever training data it had. The models did give a good output. Why do I say that? It's because it was able to identify the nuances in the image, the color of the image, the pattern, the shapes in the images, um, which is what an image classification model is supposed to do. And an accuracy of 75% for a 11 class classification is pretty good. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you.